Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. Thanks to all of you joining us here at the City Club and thanks to all of you listening live on 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream or later on on WCLV, WTAM or many of the other radio stations who air this broadcast or watching online or on WVIZ PBS. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dan Malthrop. I'm the Curator of Conversation at the Civic Commons. Today we're talking about fracking or shale development. It's fast become one of the most important issues our state is facing. The potential upside is great. Thousands of new jobs, billions in economic impact, energy independence, tens of millions in potential revenue for the state, billions in potential profit for energy developers, we're told. The potential downside is of a similar order of magnitude. There are environmental hazards from groundwater contamination to earthquakes, high levels of fresh water usage, potentially high levels of pollution, and there are economic hazards. No one, after all, wants to see this become a boom and bust story for Ohio. Of course, the General Assembly in Columbus is right now considering new regulatory and tax proposals from Governor Kasich, proposals many see as being very much middle of the road, politically speaking. Today, we bring you a forum with perspectives from industry and one part of the environmental community. This is part of a series of City Club forums on shale development. Upcoming events will be listed at, the city, at cityclub.org. Let me introduce our panelists, Mike Chadsey from Energy In Depth Ohio and Jack Shaner of the Ohio Environmental Council. Mike is the campaign director for Energy In Depth Ohio, which is the education and outreach arm of the Ohio Oil and Gas Association, also known as UGA. Uh, he's formerly worked with the office of Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor, and prior to that he worked with Taylor when she was state auditor. He was also political director at the Summit County GOP. He's a graduate of Kent State University. And Kent, of course, is where, interestingly, next week, the City Council will consider a potential moratorium on fracking. Jack Shaner is Deputy Director and Senior Director of Legislative and Public Affairs for the Ohio Environmental Council. Formerly, he served the Ohio Senate Democratic Caucus and staffed the caucus's members on the Energy, Natural Resources, and Environment Committee. Jack is a graduate of Ohio State University. So we're going to start with uh, opening statements from both gentlemen, and then we'll have moderated conversation, and then we'll get to audience questions in the second half of the program. But Mike Chadsey, go ahead and, and lay it out for us. Absolutely. What? We're happy to do that. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Dan. Thank you for that introduction. Jack, always good to see you. Appreciate uh, you being here as well, too. Look forward to our discussion. Energy in Depth is a program here in Ohio that is on the ground in eastern and southern Ohio doing a lot of these type of forums. Um, educational forums, outreach forums, putting information in the hands of folks that are going to be making those decisions about this industry uh, on the impact level. Uh, we're excited to be here. We're happy to be here. I think we're doing some great work. What's important uh, for us is to make sure that the right information gets out there. The facts, the science, the engineering. Uh, we like to say that we uh, check, check facts and bust myths uh, because there is so much information out there. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to our conversation. Okay. Jack Shaner. Thank you, Dan. Thrilled, thrilled to be here at the Cleveland City Club. I appreciate the invitation. I'm Jack Shainer, Deputy Director, Ohio Environmental Council. We're a nonprofit uh, congregation of more than 100 environmental and conservation organizations across the state. Our mission is to secure clean air, land, and water for all who call Ohio home. You know, this issue is uh, very big. You're absolutely right. And there is a potential for big jobs and investment that there's no question of that. But job one needs to be protecting our air, our land, our water, and the people that call Ohio home. I want to set the stage here a little bit, just read a quick excerpt, it's about a minute and a half here, Dan, from the recent uh, edition of Rolling Stone magazine. It's an expose on Chesapeake Energy, which is one of the largest uh, developers of the shell gas here. So here's kind of a human face of what can happen when things go wrong. This is a little vignette of Sherry uh, Vargson, a dairy farmer, lives about 20 miles from Chesapeake's operations in Pennsylvania. So this is only about a minute and a half here. Quote, drilling was an immediate nightmare. This Sherry signed a lease to drill. One morning, Sherry Vargson woke up at 6 a.m. to find 18 trucks idling in her driveway. The hillside behind her house was leveled for a dirt pad, and the rig went up 500 feet from her back door. Once the fracking began, water trucks made hundreds of trips up and down her driveway while air compressors roared all day and night. When the gas was flared off before production began, the flame was so bright in the night sky, she could see it glowing red on the horizon 12 miles away. Bargson noticed long after production began in 2009 that water in the trough out back stopped freezing on cold nights. Inside the house, 
the, uh, I'm sorry, in, inside the house, the faucet began to sputter and spit. Her husband seemed to have a lot of headaches. Sherry felt nauseous if she stayed in the shower more than a few minutes. Acting on a tip from a neighbor, she had her water tested and it was loaded with methane. Here's the conclusion quickly. Ferguson stopped drinking water after she discovered the methane, but tests showed her water also contained elevated levels of toxic chemicals like radium, magnesium, strontium. Chesapeake agreed, they did agree to test the water, uh, and they did agree to replace her water with fresh water delivered in five gallon jugs once a month, but it denies any responsibility for contaminating her water. Finally, Tom Dara, a Duke University geologist who examined the well of the Lady Vargson for a new study finds that it's difficult to square these facts, that is the claim that we have nothing to do with contamination versus the lady's experience. And the scientist concludes here, quote, anyone who has seen the data I have and thinks this much methane in her wells from natural sources has their head in the sand. The Duke study found 17 times the methane contamination, the methane in the water within a, a kilometer of these horizontal wells than your average well or your average background. And this is the deal. This is a new type of technology, the size and scale of which we've never seen in Ohio before. This is not the old vertical. This is horizontal. This is major industrial scale drilling with major industrial scale risk to our air, land, water. What you just quote, what you just cited is not, has, has that been definitively tied to the, to the fracking and the drilling in her backyard? The Duke University study looked exactly at that. They looked at wells, some 60 wells in uh, New York State and Pennsylvania State, sampling from five different counties or so, and was examining the horizontal drilling for the fracturing of the deep shale drilling, exactly. And this was the, the study result. Now, this is one study. We need a lot more studies. This is a new technology. It's been ramping up here recently in the last couple of years. We better make sure we do it right. You know, the old axiom about measure twice, cut once, uh, doesn't apply any better than right here. Mike Chadsey, how does something like that happen in an industry where we know catastrophes can happen all the time, but we also know that like the Chesapeake Energy, all the other energy developers are under a, a microscope mm -hmm. right now. How does something like that happen? Well, I think you take you know what uh, Jack mentioned here about the Duke study, and you compare that to the University of Texas Austin study, who says if you, if you do this right, which we are doing this right, that there isn't going to be contamination of your water, groundwater or surface water, because of the rules and regulations in place. There's the Penn State study that says the very same thing. Make sure you do this right, based on rules and regulations. So I would, I would, I would agree with Jack. There's a few studies that are out there. We need more. More information is good. I think it's not so much about studies yeah. as it is about cases, right? It's not, I'm not so interested in what academics are saying. Sure. I, as, a, as an Ohioan, mm -hmm. I'm sort of worried about you know, the water coming out of people's taps. Well, that's a very legitimate concern, and I think we can certainly talk about that. But again, I would refer to you that there has been no confirmed case of groundwater contamination tied to hydraulic fracturing. Is that really? Yes. Wait. Yes. Lisa Jackson, U.S. EPA. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. No confirmed case. So if if yes. if I'm a hy By if hydraulic I'm hydra fracturing, if I'm hydraulic fracturing, Correct. and I spill the fluid, the hydraulic fluid, on the on the on the surface. That, that's never happened and that's never gotten into that's groundwater? That's not the hydraulic fracturing process. That, I consider that. I'm, I'm going to okay. push back because if, I, if the process mm -hmm. is I inject the, the, the fluid, mm -hmm. I pull it back up, I have to dispose of it somewhere. It's a complete process. Okay. So, so, so can, can we agree that that, that, that has happened? A surface? So surface contamination? Surface contamination? Yeah. There has been some, yes. Okay. Um, but there has not been a case where the, where the fluid has leaked from a well, a board hole that is correct. Through, through the casing yeah. into through the, the actual aquifer. Production process, correct. You know, the uh, industry Jack likes Shainer, to, go ahead. to make this claim, uh, but we need to look at experiences around the country and, and right here in Ohio. And the, uh, likes to make, the industry likes to make a distinction between the actual fracking process, the, the process of where the chemicals in the sand and water are injected, and then not look later at during the production phase, you know, that the fracking process is a couple weeks, a month, but then there's years of that well being there and producing oil and gas and the potential for contamination. Scientists have clearly found and people have clearly experienced methane contamination. That's, that's gas uh, contamination. Could there be seepage of the actual liquids? We don't know that yet. We certainly hope not, but we also know 
we can look not just at Kate studies, as you said, Dan, but we can look at experiences. You know, the industry and the regulators like to proclaim uh, we've got the toughest regulations in the world or in the nation. You know, it just can't happen here. And then you look at Bainbridge Township, which was not, to be fair, was not the horizontal fracturing, was not, was not the deep shale. It was just the old standard vertical drilling, which we've been doing here 70, 80, what, 100 years, Mike. And yet uh, 20 people lost their water over there in Jalga County from a technology we thought we knew from regulations that have been in place for decades and decades. So what do we do? The legislature caught up and strengthened the law. And that was a good law, but it came at the expense of catching up. New Year's Eve, Youngstown, Ohio, injection wells. We've got to do something with the waste. We're getting about half the waste injected in Ohio. It's coming from Pennsylvania primarily, West Virginia, other states. This is the nasty brine chemicals that are left over that come back up. Uh, Youngstown, Ohio had a 3.0, 4.0 uh, magnitude earthquake on New Year's Eve. This followed 10, 11 smaller earthquakes in the past year. So what's happened? To its credit, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Governor Kasich have announced a number of strengthening controls, better seismic characterization. So we, we don't have a Rand McNally roadmap. We don't know the, exactly the, the underground geology. We need to get that right. That's right. But the thing is, we're always catching up. We always hear we're strong enough, we're good enough, until the next accident happens, then we catch up. So what is the, if we're going to stop playing catch up then, Jack, I'll ask you this question first and then Mike, I'd like to hear your response. If we're going to stop playing catch up and create a, a regulatory environment, and I mean this sort of holistically, not just the rules, but also a, a well-resourced Ohio Department of Natural Resources that's capable of ins doing the inspections and, and, and all of that. What does that look like? What needs to be in place? And, and is the, the current plan under consideration sufficient? I'll give uh, two responses here. First, we think there ought to be a timeout. The United States EPA is currently doing a study, a Congress request, examining, well, what are the risks to groundwater and drinking water, and then how do we manage those risks? We think it's altogether prudent, take a time out, let the United States EPA complete that study. Apparently the Ohioans agree, January Quinnipiac poll found seven out of 10 Ohioans agreed, stop, take the time to get this right. Now, there was a 50% or so said, let's go ahead, let's do it, we like the jobs. But uh, overwhelmingly, uh, there was a little schism, but overwhelmingly Ohioans said, let's do a time out, let's get this right. That oil and gas has been there millions of years, it's going to be there a few more days, a few more years, a few more uh, millennia. Let's do this right now. In the meantime, you're right. It's happening. Game is on. The drilling has begun. There's the influx of the uh, shell gas uh, drillers are coming to Ohio. You know, whether there's not, there's not even consideration, unfortunately, in the legislature of should there be a moratorium. And so it's happening. So what do we do? Well, to the governor's credit and to the Department of Natural Resources' credit, there is legislation now proposed, number of regulations proposed, to strengthen, and we give the governor credit. He's got some good things in there, but we think it needs to go much further. Such things as How better water, water quality sampling, both before drilling and after drilling. You need a baseline, what is my chemical composition of my water before the drilling starts versus after, as well as the quantity, what's the flow. Strengthen setbacks. You know, we're just uh, in the shadow here of Cleveland Brown Stadium. Imagine yourself standing at the, uh, half, uh, at the, at the goal line looking out at midfield. 150 feet, ladies and gentlemen, under Ohio law, an oil and gas well can be as close as 150 feet to an occupied, drill, to an occupied dwelling. That is not nearly enough. Floodplains, we still allow drilling in floodplains. There's no right to appeal a permit. Unlike coal, unlike other kinds of industrial activity in Ohio, Ohioans have long had the authority, the option, the right to appeal a permit. There's no right for, a, for the public to appeal an oil and gas drilling permit. The public needs better notice better comment. I see, Dan, you want to ask a question? No, I want to give, Mike a, I, I want to give Mike a chance to respond. First, the, has anything that Jack said been untrue? I want to make sure that, we're, that mm -hmm. all the facts are, are no, accurate. I, I think Dak, Jack did a nice job of describing where, what his opinion is or what his organization's but opinion is. But in terms is. of factual information, he's, he's, fine. he's correct. Absolutely. Okay, good. Now, what I would add to what Jack said or disagree slightly is, you know, we have done that. I go back to 2010 in the previous administration. Senate Bill 165 did a lot of what Jack was talking about mm -hmm. and did more. And you compare that with the stronger report, the State Review of Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Regulations, it said, our program here in Ohio is overall well managed, meeting its program objectives, and has a lot to recommend to other states. Now, the people that sit on the stronger program are the environmental community, 
the industry community, the regulatory community, both state and federal. You get all the players that need to be there in one room, and you talk about what rules and laws are on the books, and you compare and contrast those with other rules and laws that are on the books to other states. And our program is very, very well managed. And we made a lot of the necessary changes that need to be done in 2010, because mm -hmm. they saw this coming. Well, let me ask you about a few sp specific things that Jack said. He suggested that there be groundwater testing before and after. That seems like something that would protect everybody, including sure. your, the OGA's members, right? Anybody because can get their water tested at any time. <laughs> any, I, anybody can but do making, that. But making it part of the regulatory framework, making it part sure. of the standard mm -hmm. best practices so that we're ensuring, we're, we are literally ensuring that um, to minimize environmental damage mm -hmm. and responsibility where there, where there needs yeah. to be responsibility. And sure. that would protect your members, I would think, mm -hmm. from frivol frivolous lawsuits from people sure. who, who believe that the methane wasn't there before, but it actually was. You'd know. You see the companies that are, and let's, let's actually talk about the actual number of wells that we are seeing in here, Ohio in the Utica Shale. About 33, 35 have been uh, drilled, and seven of those are producing. So we're talking about a very small number here. Of right those, now. Right now, yes. The right number now. is expected to grow yes. by, you know, exponentially. Sure. Well, you add that to the 65,000 wells we already currently have in Ohio. So there's already a lot of wells. Traditional here. wells. Traditional wells. Yes. Um, but when we're talking about the Utica Shale wells, um, you've seen the companies so far do this water testing to exactly do what you're saying. Protect them, protect the residents, protect the industry, all of that. Let's make sure we have that baseline testing. And there haven't been any issues so far. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, you get the baseline. There usually aren't issues when yeah. you're just baseline testing. Um, the no, no, that's, that's the point, is uh -huh. we need to know if there's already something in the water that maybe that resident isn't aware of. Oh, right. right. So we need to make sure that we know that. Okay. Now, about the moratorium idea. Mm -hmm. Jack raises a very interesting point, and it's compelling. This, uh, this resource has been there for millions of years. What if we wait a couple of years so we can get the regulatory framework right, we can get the, the environmental, you know, all the environmental regulations right? Why not? Because I think if you talk to some of those folks, it, it'll never be right. You know, you give a mouse a cookie. They'll always want to do something else. It's never going to be enough. Thank you for raising that. My, yeah. It's a childhood it, favorite it, for my kids. It's Thanks. a great it's story. A we can talk about that. <laughs> but I, I think at some point we have to say the rules that are on the books now are strong. They're going to be enforced. We're going to trust these folks that they're going to do the right thing. They're going to have the training. And let's move forward with this. Mm -hmm. We can't wait forever. We need these jobs. We need this. Are, are, what are you going to do, or what is anybody going to do to say, oh, we don't need this energy right now? You're going to turn the heat off in your home? Jack and I drove here in cars. You're going to not have to use gas anymore? You, you can't. It's so well, I don't you think, have to I, move I, that's, I don't think that's a, that's a real accurate. I mean, it, well, I think it, it is. is. But, but I mean, proposing a one year moratorium or a two year moratorium is not a saying, three year or a five year. I mean, when is it going to be enough? Well, I mean, so, you can. Uh, you, the United States CPA is expected to wrap that study up Keener, next year. The president has asked for, I think it's $14 million, I believe, in his budget to fund that study, which is already underway. And incidentally, he's also asking to eliminate some $4 billion in subsidies to the oil and gas and uh, coal and fossil fuel industries. But, you know, so in a year, you could call my bluff, Mike. We, we would have that report. We would have it in black and white. We could compare that with Ohio's rules and regulations. We could see, well, how does Ohio's rules and regs compare with what the United States EPA is talking about? This is a brand new kind of technology that is in the terms of the scale we're on today. About half of Ohio is underlined by the Utica Shell Formation. The Department of Natural Resources uh, estimates, in fact, they use the word exponential. I heard a presentation from the last week is what we're looking at. Exponential growth in drilling. Now, to the department's credit, they're talking about tripling their staff from uh, something like 50 full-time to uh, 500 full-time people, and a lot of that out in the field, and we're going to need that. We're going to need that. You talk to the people who've had a bad experience in Pennsylvania, which there have been a number, and you know you've got to have the cop on the block, and they've got to have strength and enforcement uh, uh, capability, and the landowners need better protections. Our Ohio Attorney General, Mike DeWine, the top law enforcer in the state, has called for strength and penalties, has called for full disclosure of the chemicals, and has called for uh, uh, a landowner bill of rights. You know, we're talking about the environmental aspects. There's a whole ton of other aspects when you talk about landowners who unwittingly, unknowingly sign away perpetual rights to their water, to their land. They need protections too. Senator Frank LaRose, Republican down in Akron, is putting his shoulder to the wheel here. He's wanting to strengthen that bill that the governor's proposed. We think the governor's proposal is a good one, but it's kind of the minimum, and we've got to do a lot more, and so we're looking forward to that. I just want to close out the issue of the moratorium to make sure that we all understand it. Um, it sounded like what you were saying was 
essentially, the industry does not want a moratorium of any length because you believe that any length would be lengthened. Is it safe to assume that you also don't want a moratorium because that reduces your short-term profit possibility? Well, I think when you talk about moratoriums or suspensions or anything like that, I mean, I go back to we've been doing this since 1860, the first commercial one in Ohio. Where would we be today if we had stopped all that progress for any amount of length of time? You can only learn from this by doing it. So we can, we can look at PA. We can look at all the other states. This is happening all over the country, all mm -hmm. over the world. Mm -hmm. This is a huge opportunity for Ohio. Why would we want not capitalize on all that and put all these folks to work and have all this economic investment, $900 million by Chesapeake, $500 million by Mark West, and so many others? That's a huge investment, especially in eastern Ohio, and they need it more than anybody else right now. I understand that, but you didn't answer my question about profits. Yeah. <laughs> Is profit a dirty word? Shouldn't no, it? it's not. It's Should not. Be. But I just want to. Yeah. I just you know. I just want to be yeah. be clear that like that. Okay, we'll move on. Chemical disclosure. Okay. Why is the industry so opposed to disclosing the chemicals that are used in fracking? I think there is full disclosure in Ohio, based on the MSDS sheets, based on the fracking. I don't know ticket. what an MSDS sheet is. If you were to have a, a truck, for example, carrying water or any type of material, maybe to or from a pad site, an MSDS sheet is going to list everything that is on that truck, material safety data sheet. Mm -hmm. So that way, if there is an incident, the first responders that are there on the scene know exactly what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. That is required. And that's a very important first step. And, and is it, that a piece of public information? It is. And you can Jack, is that sufficient? That is a good public piece of information. And uh, Ohio Environmental Council fought hard to get even stronger disclosure. We did achieve that in Senate Bill 165. Now the legislation that's been proposed in the governor's energy bill would go even further. Uh, we want to get even further. You know, Americans have had a long tradition of uh, right to know. You pull any package off the shelf, any product out there in your garage, and you're going to be able to learn the ingredients. Somehow, this industry has evaded full disclosure. The governor is pushing for that, although he's allowing an exception for proprietary chemicals, that is the, the you know, Colonel Sanders secret formula. We want to get that uh, disclosed as well. Senator Frank LaRose, uh, Akron, wants to get that disclosed as well. We think the public has a right to know any time any substance is being released or potentially released into our air, land, or water. I want to go back quickly to the jobs and investment. There's no question. There's a huge potential here. But let's think about a couple things here. One, if you go over there to Pennsylvania and ask folks, uh, let's say, in the motel, hotel industry, restaurants, they'll say, yes, our parking lots are glutted with cars. When the oil and gas is on, when the game is on, they got the Pennsylvania license plates. But a couple things here. One, a lot of those are being driven by fellows up from Oklahoma and Louisiana and Texas, and we're glad to have their dollars, of course. But it's a temporary cycle. It can be a boom-bust cycle. Is this really going to be sustained? We won't know for a couple years how this thing really pans out and whether it ends up to be fool's gold or really we've hit the jackpot here. But even if it is all the dollars and jobs that the industry suggests, you cannot drink or breathe a dollar bill. And the first thing we've got to protect is our air, our land, our water. These are irreplaceable, priceless natural resources, and we've got to go the extra mile to protect them. You're I, I, agree with, I agree with that. You know, Jack, we both live here. We both drink the same water, breathe the same air. I agree with you 100%. All those things need to be done. But there's not, there's not a, a false conflict here. You can develop energy and protect the environment at the same time. Jack, do you believe that's possible? Well, we've got to do a lot better job. You know, we, we think we get it right, and then something like Bainbridge Township happens. Okay, everybody acknowledges that that driller, again, let's be fair, that was the old, you know, traditional vertical that was not the deep shell horizontal. So even after decades and decades and decades and rules and regulations, I went kablooey and 20 people, 20 people lost their water. <coughs> and it isn't really good enough for them to hear, well, you know, we're doing a pretty good job or mostly we get it right. Something went terribly wrong there. Now when you, now we're looking at the horizontal drilling, millions of gallons of water, up to 5 million gallons per well. When you're looking at a well pad, you know, the footprint of being several football fields the size, when you're looking at hundreds of chemicals up to a quarter million pounds of chemicals back down the earth, when the flow back water comes back up with the brine and with naturally occurring radioactive material, now you've got to inject that back <laughs> underground. This is when we've got to uh, make sure that we measure twice, cut once. And so why not take advantage of these studies? Southern Methodist University study looking at Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas area, looking at air pollution, something that's not gotten a lot of attention. 
The, uh, if you look at a drilling site, you'll see it gutted with not only the diesel trucks and diesel equipment, but compressors and separators. And this is a major source of air pollution, the, the pollution that causes ozone. And it found in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, one of the largest metro areas in the United States, the emissions from oil and gas drilling actually exceeded motor vehicles. This was not an outlier. Colorado Public Health Study also looked at that state and found the oil and gas industry and their air emissions exceeded those of motor vehicles in the entire state of Colorado. Finally, Wyoming, a couple of years ago, for the very first time in history, Wyoming, a uh, place where there's more prairie dogs than people, probably, literally, that, that Wyoming exceeded federal clean air standards of ozone for the first time in its history, and regulators, regulators pointed to the oil and gas industry. Because of the, tr the amount of truck traffic? It's the trucks, but it's also the equipment that's used on site during the drilling phase and even after the drilling phase. You know, it's not just during the drilling. You've got well pads, you've got compressors, you've got roads, maintenance roads. That scar will be there for a long time to you come. You bring up a really interesting point that when we talk about economic impact and these economic impact studies that we've seen proliferate, you know, like crocuses in spring, um, that uh, we're never actually calculating in those long-term external costs of pollution from just truck traffic or, or, or industrial machinery or the, the roads that have to be surfaced and then create more impermeable surface that creates more runoff and all of that stuff. Is there something the industry could be doing to calculate in those costs? And I know that part of, part of what's being considered right now and often what happens is that the industry says, hey, we're going to give you $25,000. We're going to give you $100,000 to surface these roads that we're going to be beating up. Um, but is there more in terms of the long-term impact that the industry could be doing or could be considering, putting money aside for a trust fund to deal with some of these impacts? Well, I, I think we can look a lot to the future based on what's happened in the past. And mm -hmm. I think that we can always do a better job of, of looking to the future and protecting ourselves and the communities and where we live and work and breathe. Um, can we do more? Sure, of course. Um, is that a trust fund or is that or some type of account? I, I think we can all talk about that. Uh, but let's talk, we can debate the future, but let, you know, we can, let's talk about the now. What are we doing now? The RUMA agreements, the road usage maintenance agreements, they're part of the permit now. It's a checkoff box that you have to say that we have an agreement in place with the community that we're going to be producing that we're going to either resurface the roads, take care of the roads either ahead of time, during, or before or after. So there is, a, there is a commitment from the industry and the com companies that are doing this to take care and be a good neighbor, be a good corporate citizen. Absolutely. You know, the road impacts is a serious yeah. impact, and uh, finally, our regulations are catching up. That's part of the governor's uh, legislation, that there be these road use agreements. That, that is very true. We like to see an impact fee because of first responders. There can be, you know, a huge uptick now in traffic. We're talking about hundreds of truck uh, trips potentially per well site. There have been experiences of uh, a large amount of vehicle crashes in Pennsylvania, and so that is a, an unfunded sort of mandate that's pressed down on local governments they're going to need to be responding to. Uh, when things do go south and when we do have water contamination or surface contamination, we think that's something that, you know, we hear about this industry is a big industry and it's, uh, you know, got a lot of profit to be made. Well, they ought to be able to then to uh, pay for and mop up after themselves. So why not a modest fee, a modest tax? To, have, uh, to cover these externalities. The governor's proposed, we think it's a pretty modest uh, uh, tax. He wants a tax cut. Our organization has no position on that. But uh, the industry is fighting tooth and nail to, to repel that. And they're getting a lot of traction down there at the state house. So we've got to really hold these uh, fellows accountable and keep fighting tooth and nail to put the people first. Mike Chadsey, the as far as I know, the tax cut proposal or the tax increased proposal which would fund a tax cut for residents of Ohio is off the table in the General Assembly for the moment, but it's going to come back. We know that it will come back in some fashion. What's the tax level that's, uh, that's amenable to the industry? Well, much like Jack and his organization, our organization hasn't taken a stance on that. We don't get involved. We leave the legislation to the legislators and we'll just... You don't have lobbyists? No, I'm not a lobbyist. No, but the, the industry has lobbyists. Sure, but I'm, okay. but I'm also here representing our group, Energy in Depth, which is a right. communications and outreach group, uh, an advocacy group, but uh, we're not, not taking a, we haven't taken a position on the tax piece. I, I understand, but mm -hmm. your colleagues in the OOGA have taken a position, in, in, and they, they said they don't like it. Do the, they do have. You, have they shared with you a, a percentage number that, would be, uh, that they would agree to? No, I haven't been involved in any of those okay. conversations. All right. Um, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Friday forum with Mike Chadsey of Energy in Depth Ohio and Jack Shaner from the Ohio Environmental Council. We're talking about fracking and shale development.
We'll return to our panel in a minute for the traditional City Club questions from the audience. Please formulate your questions for our speaker now and remember that questions should be brief and to the point. We know that passions run high on this topic, but please make them questions. We also remind you that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums and we hope everyone listening will join the City Club. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country that air our broadcasts. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ, PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. This year, 2012, the City Club of Cleveland turns 100 years old. There are several programs scheduled, including the second in the Encore Speaker Series, April 18th, with John Dean, former White House counsel to President Richard Nixon. For more information on this and other programs, visit the 100th Anniversary tab on our website. We would like to welcome guests today at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler and Fairmount Minerals. Thank you very much for your support. We would also like to welcome students here who are able to attend as part of our student program, made possible by a generous gift from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Fund. Joining us today are students from the New Day Academy Boarding and Day School, St. Martin de Porres, and Montessori High School. Will the students please stand to be recognized? Now we return to our panel for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We welcome questions from everyone, including desk, guests. Pardon me. Holding microphones today are City Club Program Director Kerry Miller and Special Initiatives Coordinator Philip Williams. Our first question. I want to thank both of you gentlemen for having an intelligent discussion of an issue that I think is very important. Um, I want to focus on a different part of the water issue within this, and that's the production water side of the not the groundwater or the water table so much, but uh, I think, Jack, you said something about large amount of water goes into one of these wells. Um, and we know there have been some disposal issues, i.e. the uh, injection well in Youngstown that had a problem. Um, two specific questions. One, where does that water come from and how does it get sourced, essentially? And two, when it comes back up the well or stays in the ground, what is the industry doing to decontaminate it and return it to the water table? And my example would be that we just signed a compact in the Great Lakes to make sure the Great Lakes don't lose a large portion of its water resource, that it basically gets recycled if it's taken out of the area and put back into the water table. Is that kind of process being considered by the industry for this kind of activity, not in the Great Lakes Basin, in, in Ohio mostly. Jack Shane of the Ohio Environmental Council, go ahead. Sure, that's a great question here. Uh, source is uh, wherever the industry can, can get it now. They need a significant source that can be up to 5 million gallons uh, per well. Uh, there have been city governments, local governments that have cooperated and made available their reservoir or their well field. Uh, uh, for payment, and so uh, have decided to do that. Uh, certainly, the industry needs uh, permission to utilize water. That could be part of the lease agreement from the, the property owner, potentially, if they have a significant enough source of surface or groundwater. You asked about the, uh, the water comes back up. So it's to industry's advantage, of course, to recycle as much water as they can and not have to tap a new source or, or buy new water. But uh, you put your finger on a very serious concern, and that, that is... So there is the chemicals that are used, uh, hundreds of potentially chemicals, up to a quarter million pounds of chemicals used per well. Now, by volume, it's a tiny percent, the chemicals of, of all that water, but a little dab will do you when you're talking about 1% of a quarter million gallons. In fact, the Akron Beacon Journal estimated it was up to a million pounds of chemicals in a single well in, in uh, Carroll County. So that is fouled water that comes back up. Yes, it can be recycled, can be used to frack, the next well down the road, and that is the preferred method. But Ohio has uh, some 180, I think, of these injection wells around the state where we are injecting this waste deep, deep underground. Hopefully it stays there. We don't have a problem like we had in Youngstown, Ohio, where the driller drilled deep down into the Precambrian basement rocks. Any geologist will tell you that that is an invitation to trouble, as apparently happened in Youngstown, and it lubricated a fault. Uh, and caused an, an earthquake there. So we've got to be really careful of this. We've got to find better technologies. I don't know if it is possible 
to clean that water up uh, like we do other waste water and then return that to the water cycle if that's possible that would clearly be the preferred method because we're talking about taking millions millions eventually billions of waters out of the water cycle once you inject this underground it's deep deep underground you ain't getting that back uh, to serve our needs Mike Chatsy do you have anything to add to that uh, no, I think Jack did a great, you know, great job, but I'd like to put a little bit in perspective. Uh, when we talk about, you know, the chemical piece, there's a reason those chemicals are in there, um, you know, to protect the well casing so that we don't have a water aquifer situation. You know, those are in there to kill all the bacteria uh, that are down there from many millions of years ago. So they serve a purpose, and they are, um, you know, important to the process. And I think Jack described everything, including the injection well, uh, wastewater class 2 injection well in Youngstown, um, you're right, it was drilled in the Precambria rock, the basement rock. That was too deep. That's where all the faults were. I think we support the, what the governor did in putting a suspension on that and all the other wells in a five-mile radius uh, until they did a study, which they concluded that that was too deep. So from now on, won't be able to drill that uh, deep anymore. And those, those were good things, lessons that, that were learned from that situation. And Jack Shaner, to be clear about the Great Lakes Water Compact that the, the guest mentioned, this amount of water does not viol would not violate the compact. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. The Great Lakes Compact agreement amongst all the Great Lakes states and then a similar parallel but separate agreement with uh, Quebec and Ontario to protect our water from not being siphoned off to Arizona or Asia, four corners of the world, but also to protect and make sure we're not over tapping water right here within the drainage basin. And so a very critical component of the debate is, okay, how do you measure? How do you know whether that's sustainable, whether you're withdrawing too much? And uh, a big tussle right now in the legislation it will be debated again. Governor Kasich was correct. We applaud him for, for vetoing that first bill that was too industry friendly. The second one, though, has a, a recurring problem. That is, it wants to measure over a 90-day period, a 90-day average of how much water is being withdrawn. Well, you could have a big gulp on one day and then a small gulp the rest of those uh, 89 days and would average out to a small uh, uh, amount of water. So this is a really serious concern. The oil and gas industry has not been a big, uh, publicly a big part of this debate, but clearly that 90-day average would favor the industry. But 5 million gallons per well is still actually just a, is not enough to, it doesn't reach the threshold. You're correct. The thresholds are being talked about uh, per day for, the, for Lake Erie and for uh, surface uh, streams that's the, and, and the groundwater water. would not trip that. But in the aggregate, these are going to add up. Thank you. Our next question. Yeah, uh, this is for Mr. Shaner. I, um, the Ohio Environmental Council has a long and storied tradition. I think it's o o over 40 years of in in involving and engaging and protecting Ohio citizens, citizens from abuses of the industry and or even promoting an, a, an image where, in fact, we can work with industry and we have a positive future for, for us all. Um, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Shaner, what can we do as citizens what do you recommend? What does the Ohio Environmental Council recommend that we do to help promote the, some of the things that you think are important? Thank you. Uh, one thing you can all do today on your way out at the information table, you'll see a fact sheet from uh, you can think both of our organizations. But also I've got a postcard out there that would ask you to sign and leave behind. And that is a postcard uh, asking for this moratorium. Let's get this uh, in place, this temporary moratorium. Let's take the time to have the scientists examine and come back and we can compare that with Ohio's rules and regulation and, and bring our rules and regs up at least to that minimum standard that the US EPA may be recommending. Secondly, is to uh, you know, support, uh, we're going to have a big debate now on not just oil and gas, but all forms of energy. The governor's proposed his own uh, energy proposal, and it's, it's sort of a, all the above, all things to all people. He's got oil and gas, clearly. He's also got room for energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, but there's a potential risk to renewable energy uh, that is it could be gobbled up by something called uh, cogeneration. This is something we support when you have heat and waste going up a smokestack. If you can capture that and make power, that's a great thing. We just don't want it to come at the expense of renewable energy, which is the way the proposal would now be that uh, this, this very uh, cheap, ubiquitous form of energy from factories could gobble up and displace the more expensive wind and other uh, kinds of renewables. So please get engaged in this debate about our, our future. What kind of future do we want for Ohio? Do we want just a black, uh, you know, gold kind of economic development uh, fuels? Or do we want the green? Do we want the wind, the sun, the efficiency also? 
just to be clear, what you're saying is that the in the governor's proposal, cogeneration would count towards any renewable portfolio, renewable quota. That's, That's correct. That's what you meant. That's okay. correct. Okay. Mike, would you like a chance to, uh, to tell people what they should do? Uh, I mean, because Jack just got to do a big plug for his organization, so if you'd like to do one for yours. Did you want to finish with the website? <laughs> <laughs> www.theoec.org. Uh, Oregon Environmental Council beat us to it, so put the T-H-E first, theoec.org. Thank you. There you go. Anything we can do to help, Jack. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and you're doing plenty. Thank you. Um, it, you know, we joke here, but I think what's so great is not only for organizations like Jack's or mine or others that are out there, is, is participating in that debate. And, and we've been in plenty of forums, and Ron and a few others in the room have been on plenty of forums, and, and having that intelligent conversation, bringing ideas to the table, and having a debate about it. I mean, I think that's what a lot of folks can do. Uh, learn about it. Educate yourself. Go to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources website. Learn about the history of this industry and others in the state of Ohio, and participate in that conversation. Those, those are all very good things. And we are eidohio.org. Our next question. Uh, this question is to Mr. Chasky. You've been talking today about the uh, uh, fracking uh, and, uh, and the uh, opportunities for going down thousands of feet and putting great pressure, inserting water or chemicals to break up the shale and get more oil, more gas. And you've been trying to point out, as I understand it, uh, ways to minimize the, uh, the harm to the environment. And uh, recently, I've noticed that in uh, all kinds of media, uh, newspapers, magazines, and televisions, the major oil companies have been saying the same thing, but they're also saying they are finding a way to use renewable sources of energy to find energy uh, that will be different than oil. My question is, to what extent would your uh, organization, which is uh, basically designed for oil and gas, be willing to likewise commit resources to develop and refine and utilize uh, renewable sources which have zero pollution? Uh, excellent question. I, I think we are for all the above. You know, what we say is if you are a community that consumes energy, you should be a community that produces energy. And here in Ohio, what Ohio can contribute to that is oil and gas development. And I think there are some states out west that can contribute to solar piece. And there's others up in maybe along the lake or others that contribute to the wind piece of it. Uh, we also have coal in our history. I think anybody who uses energy should also, uh, you know, produce it. And, and have that as an opportunity to contribute that to the conversation. But to your point, sir, yes, absolutely. We, we support all the above. Fossil fuels at some point are going to run out. But also the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So we do need an all the above approach. You know, Toledo, Ohio is now uh, second largest uh, manufacturer of solar uh, panels in the United States. It's a major uh, growing uh, part of their uh, economic uh, future up there. Uh, again, I uh, would urge you all to talk about citizen involvement here to get engaged in this debate about energy. We're going to have a, a debate about Ohio's renewable energy future. We have, for the first time now, by law, electric utility companies must invest continuing amounts in renewable energy and in energy efficiency. Uh, the governor is uh, leaving those standards in place. However, he is asking to expand that definition. Well, what is renewable energy under Ohio law to include cogeneration? We want to, we were, he's right. Let's capture this cogeneration. Let's capture that waste heat. It's right now just going up the stack. When you see that shimmering uh, heat waves and when you see steam, that is wasted energy. If we could capture that, utility or a factory then could be more self-sufficient. It could boil water, make steam, make electricity. That is a very good, laudable goal, and we salute Governor Kasich for that. But let's not do it at the expense of developing our own homegrown wind and solar and other renewable sources. Thank you, Jack Shainer. Yeah, I uh, work to promote uh, the rail industry, and in fact, I've, I've done some work with the Ohio Environmental Council. Um, and I was just in Youngstown yesterday working on some rail projects, and there's earth-shaking stuff happening there every day with economic impacts. Uh, it's really quite a sight to see in, a, in an area that's been in a recession, if not depression, for 35 years. So there's some definite economic benefits from this thing. Uh, we acknowledge the drawbacks. Uh, but just with like driving cars, which, um, you know, can be unsafe in, you know, when they're not driven responsibly, 40,000 people drive in cars each year or die in car accidents each year, but we don't ban cars. Do you think that a, a drilling ban is too draconian? This question is for both of you. Uh, this is uh, Jack. I'll be happy to take the first swing here, Rob. 
We are not calling for a ban, we're calling for a moratorium. A moratorium is a temporary uh, situation. It's putting this in advance, let's hold this off until we can have that study. This is, uh, you know, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, if we can't count on the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to do an objective, thorough analysis, which they're currently underway, is to be completed next year of what are the risks to drinking on groundwater and how do we manage those risks. It seems altogether reasonable and appropriate and conservative to wait for that study. It's to be completed next year. What is the rush? The oil and gas ain't going anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. Wouldn't you rather uh, wake up in a year and, and be assured, hey, guess what? Ohio meets and exceeds the recommendations of the feds. Or, hey, guess what? We're not quite up to snuff. Uh, why not get the benefit of that study before rushing forward? You're right, there are advantages. There are economic uh, opportunities here that are presenting themselves. We don't want to miss out on that, that's to be sure. But once you foul your air, your land, your water, it can be a mighty pretty penny to ever get it back if you can. Mike Chatsy of Energy In Depth. You bring up an excellent point because this whole conversation whether you're for it or against it or don't understand it or don't want to be involved, it, it is about managing risk. And, and to your point about cars, that's why we don't let 12-year-olds drive cars 90 miles an hour backways on the highway because it's about managing risk. You do things that make sense. So I think we have the regulations that are in place and you compare that with the Stronger Report. You compare that with EPA uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson's comments about how this can and will be done safely. So we've got all, I, I believe that we have all the studies we have, all the information we have, and it, it, we're not rushing. There, there is no fast pace. There, uh, there are seven wells that are being produced right now, 33, 35 that have been drilled. It's moving very slowly. People are being very cautious. The other thing to remind yourself is we are very much in the infancy of this Yucca shale play. We're going to continue to learn. We're going to continue to see investment. And we take it one day at a time, one well, one rig at a time. And let's, let's continue to learn. Let's continue to improve. Let's continue to evolve. Necessity is the mother of all invention. We will have continue to have innovation. But let's not, to your point, sir, and to your question, a stop or slow down or suspend or ban or moratorium, any of those kind of things. Let's just proceed cautiously and continue to have this investment and can continue to have you know, homegrown energy. Note of caution. Go ahead. Ohio has quite a number of injection wells. Uh, our neighbors, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, uh, and apparently New York, find it uh, economical to ship the fracking waste from their states all the way to Ohio to get rid of it. Why? <laughs> Mike Chatsy, I'll, I'll let you start. Well, gee, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's so nice. Um, there are a couple of things we can talk about that. Uh, the first thing I would refer to is the Interstate Commerce Clause. No state can prevent another state from shipping, whether it's liquid or solid, to and from another state. So since we have to accept what they're going to ship to us, we're going to charge them for it. And we do have 180 Class II injection wells in the state of Ohio, but there are about 144,000 across the country. Um, Ohio has primacy over our Class II injection well program. PA and a few other states don't. So that means our regulations meet and exceed the federal standards. So we continue to accept that fluid, uh, but we're also a shipper. I mean, we, we ship out a lot of things as well, too, but to your point, um, you can't stop it. Interstate Commerce Clause says you have to, so if we're going to, we're going to charge them for it. But that doesn't really get to the question. The, the underlying his question is, why wouldn't New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, um, you know, deal, have their own injection wells get up to the, be competitive mm -hmm. in, this, in this marketplace? The, uh, as far as I know, uh, I'm not that familiar with PA in New York, but they do have a few injection wells, particularly in PA. Uh, they're going to get more, but their permit process is through the federal government, where ours is through the state, and I think that takes a little bit longer. Um, and I, I mean, I believe that's what the situation is. Jack Shaner. Uh, real quickly, I'm uh, reminded here, I'm seeing three, uh, three of my heroes sitting in front of me here, uh, Virginia Venney, Charlie Butts, former members of the Ohio General Assembly, and Steve Saddam. Uh, first director of Ohio Environmental Council back in 1980s, Ohio law was strengthened. Uh, that is, at the time, uh, it was lawful to just uh, spread the waste out on the ground from drilling incredibly. And a lot of it was uh, slipshod and dumped into streams and inappropriately. And, and uh, So Ohio banned that operation. 
and Ohio required to injection deep underground. That's why we have 180 of these wells around the state. This was a good move, no question, to get this hopefully safely contained. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a perverse kind of inverse of our, of our ancient Indian mounds. That is where ancient man would uh, celebrate and commemorate, uh, memorialize uh, 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 creativity or, or creation and build these ancient mounds, those burial sites. Today, what has modern man done? Well, we're taking waste materials and injecting it deep underground into Mother Nature where she's left empty caverns. Now, so far we think, so far so good. Uh, you know, Mother Nature takes a while to uh, move around. It may be centuries before we regret that decision. It certainly was the right decision at the time. But you gotta ask yourself, well, how in the heck did, uh, what went wrong up there in Youngstown? Why did we have a magnitude 4.0, 3.0, whatever it was, earthquake up there? from this, this waste that was injected deep underground. Why is it we've been at it for 25 years and this fellow that was injecting waste, uh, you know, went too deep. We think we have the regs right. We think we're watching them. We think we have adequate safeguards in place. And then something like Youngstown, Ohio happens. Uh, to the question about why is it Pennsylvania and New York are not injecting their waste underground. I've heard, we talk about a myth. I've heard a myth that, uh, well, their geology is different. I've heard a top, uh, you know, United States EPA said that is not the case. The case is Ohio chose to go ahead to get primacy, that is to, to enforce the federal law and to have these, and Mike is correct, that once you have that, you cannot repel, you can't keep the out-of-state waste out. But now we have kind of a 21st century uh, 20 uh, mule team uh, here where by the truckload, by the train load, Mansfield, Ohio is looking at now inheriting, uh, getting one of these own injection sites of their own and the waste is projected to be coming by the train load to Mansfield and injected deep underground. God help us if it doesn't stay down there because we could have more earthquakes or potentially other hazards. Our next question. Um, hi, my name is Eric Buchanan Gilbert. I'm doing a research um, subject on, um, on a hydraulic fracturing. I heard that Dick Cheney actually exempt companies from uh, the Clean Water Act. So if that is the case, then if water contamination happened, does that mean that the companies won't have to clean it up? Uh, this is Jack. Uh, Jack Shainer, Ohio I can't say, Council. I can't say whether uh, that was uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, it, is, it is clear that the Halliburton Corporation he used to work for, uh, among other oil and gas companies, sought uh, a free pass from Congress, sought an exception to evade some uh, laws that other industries have to comply with. And this is why we're always seems like trying to catch up and, and place regulations on this industry. You know, in Ohio law, if there's a, a coal mine going in next to you and the Department of Natural Resources says, yes, we will give permission to do that mining under the following conditions. You as a citizen have a right to appeal that, to say, I disagree. You could say, I don't think there should be any coal mining, or you could say, I think this control that you've placed, this condition in the permit is not strong enough. You as a citizen do not have that right when it comes to oil and gas law. We think every Ohio citizen should have that right across the board. and We think the oil and gas industry should have to adhere to every environmental law on the books, uh, state and national both. Mike Chatsey, anything to add? Uh, you know, I've heard that same type of comment to, from the 2005 energy bill uh, from the federal uh, regulators. Um, no, I, I, don't, I disagree. I don't think there was any sort of loophole or anything else that Dick Cheney or anybody else put in. Um, oh, if you want to talk about companies and transparency, I, I, in your research project, go to Halliburton.com. On their front page, did you see all the constituents that they list? They list everything that they've ever put in any well right on their front page. It's all about trend. Their proprietary chemicals? Well, or everything that they've ever used is on there, absolutely. Well, if that's the case, then they shouldn't object to uh, full disclosure here. Yep. We're having this debate, and the industry it is, is saying, full disclosure. we don't want to disclose our proprietary, our secret formula. But if, if Halliburton's put it on their website, mm -hmm. then they ought to be okay in Ohio law. All right. Another question, please. Uh, I'm Shirley Ashby from Chagrin Falls. Uh, I understand there are some countries in Europe that have banned fracking altogether. Uh, and could you tell me why? Jack Shaner? 
I understand that there are uh, some countries, I'm not as familiar outside of the United States, I get a little parochial and it's all I can do to keep up with Ohio law sometimes, but uh, in the United States, uh, uh, New York uh, has had a moratorium, uh, New Jersey, I believe, uh, you know, certainly Ohio would not be alone. Uh, you know, New York has, I believe, protected against drilling, if I'm not correct, in the, or, or the aquifer extends to their uh, drainage basin that would feed New York City. Because you can imagine the expense, <laughs> the challenge, even if you could find the technology to clean up the water, but, uh, you know, for that significant uh, uh, drinking water source there, of millions and millions of people. And so other uh, states, I believe, I believe you're correct, other nations have placed a moratorium on drilling wouldn't be that uh, uh, out of the mainstream to consider it here in Ohio, too. And there are localities, municipalities in Ohio that have created local moratoriums well, for I, fracking on public lands. Well, they're trying, uh, but uh, you know the, uh, the state of Ohio, at the request of the oil and gas industry, uh, here about 12 years ago, repealed the authority of local governments to control the placement, the, uh, the uh, permitting, uh, the drilling of oil and gas. After decades of us all living peacefully, coexistence, uh, the General Assembly ceded to the industry's request and repealed local control over oil and gas. The industry also knocked on the door six, seven, eight years in a row. Uh, Governor Taft said no. Governor Strickland said no. I'm sorry that Governor uh, Kasich said yes to opening our state parks to oil and gas drilling. Uh, you know, I'll give this industry credit. It's, it never is shy about knocking on the door and asking for permission to, uh, to drill and frack its way across. Seems like every inch of landscape in Ohio seems like there's no sacred land out there. Jack Shaner is with the Ohio Environmental Council. Mike Chadsey with Energy In Depth Ohio. I thank you both very much for your time. It's thank, been great. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a Friday forum about Ohio's fracking debate. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.